Welcome back to the channel. My name is Lisa Elvin Stoltare, and I am a genealogist and a passionate traveler. Each week, I try to focus on one new fille du roi and one new fille marguée. The fille marguée are the original, original founding mothers, if you will, the grandmothers, and there are over 260 of them. Today's episode is number 67. So in case you wanted to know where the other ones are, you can look at the playlist on YouTube or you can go on my website, Have Roots Will Travel, and you would be able to click on the link on the index that I provided there to find your particular ancestor. So without further ado, let's get started. But first, I want to sh show you ways you can support the channel. The first three keep you in the know. Subscribe, like, and notify. All that helps my logarithms. And the next couple of ways are ways to help the channel grow. We have Coffee and Patreon, which are external platforms that you can donate a dollar or five dollars or however. And um, you can also donate at um, Have Roots Will Travel on my website. I have a PayPal button and. Uh, YouTube also permits me to do the super thanks as well. All of that helps my channel grow and prosper. So thank you so very, very much for all of you who have been with me for so long. I truly appreciate every, every one of you. Thank you. And let's get started, shall we? Before we get started, let's talk a little bit about Les Filles This was a period between 1634 and 1662. These were ladies who came individually. Sometimes, in a, you know, a few ladies would come on a, on a ship. But by and large, they were individual. They were not a part of a group. They were not signed by the government. They came of their own adventurous spirit and their need to establish their own lives. And the fact of the matter is, the filles the marriageable girls, as we call them in English, were a group were about 10 and they averaged about 10 a year so that wasn't enough to really populate a country and this is why Lifi Jawa eventually replaced these ladies but ultimately we owe a debt of gratitude to, the, to these Fia Marie because they paved the way many of these Fia Marie their descendants would go on <clears throat> to either marry uh, descendants and intermingle, or alternatively, uh, the later Les Filles Marie would end up uh, being either godmothers or that's uh, being people that Les Filles du Roi could uh, rely upon. So they were truly the founding grandmothers of, of Quebec. And Les Filles du Roi founding mothers, we can't take that away from them. But these women were brave. Remember that in 1634, Trois Rivières had just been has just been inaugurated. Montreal wasn't even a city yet. So these are they came to the wilderness that was New France and made it into a country. So let's get started and find out who our family is of this episode. Today we're doing the family episode 67. And her name is Jacqueline Lagrange. And she comes to us from a viewer request, and I do not have her in any of my files. So let's get to know Jacqueline a little bit better. Jacqueline was born in 1640 in Boulogne-sur-Mer, in France, obviously. Her parents were Jean Lagrange and Marguerite Bourré. Now, the Eau de France, the area that she comes from, Boulogne-sur-Mer, is a commune, and it's found in the region of Eau de France. And inside that region, we have the département, or county, as we would call it in America, Pas de Calais. Now, the St. Nicolas Church, is emanates that you see on the top right, is a 12th century church. So it was definitely the church that she would have been baptized in. Julius Caesar is said to have founded this place in 55 AD. I mean, can you imagine? In the Middle Ages, Boulogne held the prestigious position of being the capital of its own country, a title bestowed upon it in the mid-9th century. The city played a pivotal role during the Norman conquest of England with Count Eustache II assisting William the Conqueror in his historic campaign. Boulogne's historical tapestry is woven with threads of significance. It was here that the city's Notre Dame Cathedral was founded by the Count's wife, becoming a revered pilgrimage site from its inception in the 12th century onward. Fourteen French kings and five English 
Harps graced the halls of this amazing church. Before the 12th century, Boulogne thrived as a vital whaling center, and its fortunes were very much tied to the sea. The city's survival rested on the shoulders of fishing, and by 1203, Count Lanoue granted Boulogne its municipal charter and cemented its status as a thriving community. However, Boulogne's history was not without some strife. The area witnessed fierce battles between the French and the English, their, their conflict echoing throughout the ages. During the Hundred Years' War, English occupations left their mark on this city. In 1492, Henry VII laid siege to Boulogne, a confrontation ultimately resolved by the Peace of Etaples. Yet the city's faith remained intertwined with England as it was once again occupied by English forces from 1544 to 1550. The turning point came in 1550 with the Peace of Boulogne, which marked the end of hostilities between France, England, and Scotland. France reclaimed Boulogne, paying a hefty sum of 400,000 crowns. Despite its incredible past, the city persevered, even as a culture uh, of smuggling lingered until 1659. The Treaty of the Pyrenees shifted the borders, altering the city's destiny as it moved northward within French, French territory. Boulogne's rich heritage continues to resonate a testament to its enduring significance in European history. Now, I give you all of that detail because I wanted you to know where Jacqueline came from. So I really studied this area and I truly was immersed in the fact that here was this lady that came to us from this incredible place and had an English, you know, they had they had English, they had French, they had Scottish even at some point. So she would have experienced this at, you know, as she was growing up, this kind of, you know, multiculturalness. So it's very interesting that she chose um, to come to New France. And I love that, that she comes from this incredible place. So if this is your ancestry, you can be absolutely proud. And this definitely is a place to put on a map for you to visit. Jacqueline would, would leave and come to New France after her father's death in 1658. Now, the groom that she selected and who selected her, his name was Michel Théodore de Gilles. He was born in 1628 in Tours, and his, his parents were Gabriel Théodore and Julienne Irosom. Now, let's talk a little bit about where he's from. Now, Tools is found in the region of Centre Val de Loire. You can see it on the upper left. And inside of that, it's part of the Indre et Loire uh, département. It's the commune of Tours has about 136,000 inhabitants, while the population of the whole area is about a half a million. Tours became a part of the Roman Empire during the first century AD. By the fourth century, it was renamed Tools, and its famous amphitheater was built. And what we now know is that this was an incredible uh, church, Notre Dame, um, the Notre Dame church that basically was destroyed uh, and, and it was sold and then destroyed uh, in 1792 by a small uh, thing called the French Revolution. This is a picture of tools as it existed, as it exists today. Um, just the upper right, you can see like it's got that medieval look to it, you know, and we absolutely know that uh, Tours is an important part of the history of France. So it's kind of interesting that both Michel and Jacqueline come from these very, very prominent places. So I just think that that's fascinating to kind of, they, they kind of merge their, their histories, if you will. So let's find out how Michel arrived in New France. Now, Michel has the honor of being part of La Grande Recrue de saint saint antoine the Great Recruitment of 1653. This is, these are the hundred people or so that came to Montreal at the bequest of Maisonneuve because he knew Montreal was dying and it needed a you know, a influx of people to sustain it and protect it. And these people were paid money to be able to come to Montreal. So he literally, the Maison actually went 
on a recruiting. And he recruited a wonderful lady named Marguerite Bourgeois, who we will talk about in a minute. But um, Michel was part of that recruitment. So he would come in 1653. He was actually a master mason, a paver, and a laborer. He would receive 115 pounds in advance upon signing his contract. In 1659, he would obtain his own land from Maisonneuve. So it was very, if you could survive, it was very advantageous. And so Michel and Jacqueline were married September 16, 1658. And this is a copy of their marriage record. And I want you to see the very prominent Paul de Chomedy, yes, who signed the, who was a witness to their wedding. So let's talk about Montreal, the wonderful city that would become Montréal, as we say in French, started off as Villemarie by the founder, Paul de Chomedy, Soeur de Maisonneuve, and was essentially a missionary center that was founded in May of 1642. The colony would not thrive, and it was on the verge of extinction when Chomedy decided to return to France to recruit those 100 settlers, of which Michel was a part. From this small group would evolve the Notre Dame Congregation, from the Sister Marguerite Bourgeois, who was on that boat. When Montreal was founded, the new colonists were rapidly confronted by a fearsome enemy, the Iroquois. Unfortunately, there was still no regular army on Montreal soil until 1665, when the Carignan-Sanea Regiment landed there. In militias capable of resisting Iroquois attacks were set up. On January 27, 1663, Chamonix de Maisonneuve created the Saint Famille militia to protect Ville-Marie and its inhabitants. It was made up of 139 voluntary colonists divided into 20 squads. So this is kind of, you can see that an island city that was Montreal was a, you know, was a kind of a fool's goal because Montreal was viewed as kind of, you know, a place where no one would go. And Quebec City and Tuolumne Valley kind of looked at it and laughed. Well, ultimately, there they would it would become this amazing place because of the fact that it is an island, and so um, part of that shipping and and part of the international scene. But at its very inception, it faced a lot, a lot of issues. We go on to have two children, Marie Barbe and Marie Francois Dormain de la Lame, but did not have any children. Jeanne would marry Pierre Hug and have eight children, six of whom would leave descendants. Pierre, as always, was very brave and he signed up for the Maisonneuve Militia in 1663. He was part of the 16th Squadron. On the 5th of May, 1664, Michel was killed at Long Point. We know this because it is written in his burial record. He was just 30 years old. He and Jacqueline had been married a mere five years at this point. The second groom that would arrive for Jacqueline was Laura Glory de La Bière, born 1639 in New York, in France. His parents were Pierre Glory and Louise Gouty. New York is a commune in the Deux-Sèvres department. It belongs to the region of Nouvelle-Aquitaine that you can clearly see on the, uh, on the really far left, Nouvelle-Aquitaine. And then on the second, your second slot, second picture, you can see Deux-Sèvres. So it's really at the very, very top of that region. So Deux-Sèvres is the department where New York comes from. And today it's a major business area with it has a population of about 58,000. But its origins are in the 7th century when a small bridge was built over the Sèvres and was named Neufourg. The village became known as Noviotom and then Niort. In the 12th and 13th century, as the ocean extended as far as this town, it made it a prosperous port with, with, um, that could you know, welcome hundreds of sailing barges and that carried salt and wine, cereals and skins and brought prosperity to this town. King Henry II of England and his son Richard I, Lionheart, erected the castle you see on your left, on your actual right. That's the castle. This city became one of the centers of Protestantism in Western France and suffered after the Edict of Nantes in 1685. The church that you see in the upper, I guess the upper right, 
example of your screen was first built on this site in the 11th century and finally replaced in the 15th. That building was destroyed by the Huguenots in 1588, and it was then rebuilt. It, it sub subsequently kept being rebuilt, and ultimately this is the, the new church that was rebuilt. So it does not look as it would have looked back in Laurent's day. So why did Laurent leave this amazing place and come to New France? Well, Laurent would come to New France sometime around 1658. We do have evidence that he signed a marriage contract, but did not go through with it, as far as we know. And he would have served in Chamonix, or Maisonneuve's militia. He was part of the 13th Squadron, and presumably may have known Michel, and that is the connection to his widow. Now, I also want to point out that he, his father, Laurent's father, uh, was a beer maker, and a brewer, if you will, and la bière equals beer. So that is why he was known as Laurent Fleury de la bière. Uh, there is no evidence that that is what Laurent did, but obviously it was definitely um, something that he was known for. So Jacqueline and Laurent would marry July 23rd, 1664, in the, in the church at Montreal. The old village of Rivière des Brairies is located on the northeastern part of the tip of the island of Montreal. So I love that map because it really indicates you can see that we have Montreal Nord, we have Saint Laurent, Les Leonard, we have Anjou. So you can see where Rivière des Brairies really exists, and it's right next to Pointe aux Trembles. They are said to have set up temporary camps here during the beginnings of Montreal, and the site was frequented by French explorers and missionaries throughout the years. The river is said to have been named after the first European who apparently navigated its waters in 1610, and he was known as the Sœur de Prairie, a navigator from Saint-Malo, and he was a companion of Champlain. I did not know this before I did this research. It was really fascinating. The six, in 1663, the Sulpicians became the seigneurs of the island of Montreal. They first granted two fiefdoms located east of the present-day village of Rivière des Prairies, and then granted land to settlers in 1671. In 1687, the parish of Saint Joseph de Rivière des Prairies was founded, and by the 1730s, a village eventually grew. In 1954, the Rivière de the city of Rivière de Prairie was incorporated, then annexed to the city of Montreal. So now it's part of Montreal. So this is where they emigrated to. So they were really, really law, uh, very uh, original settlers here. So they would go on to have seven children. The firstborn, Thérèse, married Jean Monet and had three children, all of whom made it to adulthood. Then we have Laurent, who married Françoise Vanchy, but did not leave any descendants. Marie Charlotte married Jean Auger and had four children, all of whom made it to adulthood. She then married Jean Priard and had one child who made it to adulthood. Her third marriage to Pierre Dumas did not produce any children. Marguerite would die at the age of 15. Jean did not marry. Françoise would die after the 1681 census. And lastly, Catherine married Maurice Noel and had five children, all of whom made it to adulthood. We see in the 1666 census, Laurent, Jacqueline, Marie Theodore, and Jeanne Theodore, so those are her, her, first, her children from her first marriage, and then Thérèse is listed on the, 16th, on the um, 1666 census. Now, in the 1667, we have Laurent, Jeanne Lagrange, we have Marie Barbe, Jeanne, Thérèse. There is no differentiation in there. So that's why it's very important to kind of say, okay, who are, why are they called Theodore? If you, if you didn't know the history, you would wonder who are they. And they own um, two beasts and 12 arpamara, about 10 acres of land. Jacqueline would have to endure another sudden death. Laurent would pass away at the age of 43 in March of 1681. 
just absolutely tragic. So the 1681 census finds her, Jacqueline Lagrange, Veuve de Glory, 40, her children, Laura, Marie, Marguerite, Jacques, Françoise, Catherine, who was born posthumously. And so they listed her as one year of age, but she was actually born after Laura died. They own one cow and five alfabala. So that is about two to three acres of land. Jacqueline's third groom, his name was Nicolas Regenou, and he was born in 1646 in Poitiers. His parents were François Regenou and Jeanne et Geoffrey. Now, Poitiers is a city on the Clay River in west central France. It's a commune of about 88,000 people, and it is found in the Vienne département of the region of Nouvelle-Aquitaine. Eleanor of Aquitaine frequently resided in the town, which she embellished and fortified, and in 1199 entrusted with communal rights, which made it a commune. In 1152, she married the future King Henry II of England in Poitiers Cathedral. History is absolutely all around you at Poitiers, and it was founded um, by the Pictons, who were a Gaulish tribe and rose to prominence as the former capital of Poitou. A pivotal turning point came in AD 732 when someone near Poitiers, the cavalry of Charles Martel, defeated the Muslim forces and ended three, thus ending Muslim attempts to conquer France. Until 1792, this sublimely beautiful city was known as the town of 100 bell towers. The remarkable churches that remain today are in part a legacy of Eleanor's Aquitaine's financial support. The Saint-Jean, the Petrie of, of Saint-Jean, is a Roman Catholic church and it is reputed to be the oldest existing Christian building in France and one of the most prominent example of Moravian architecture and dates from the third century AD. Just amazing, amazing. Absolutely on the bucket list. So she would marry a third time on November 27, 1681, about six months after um, Laura had passed away. So Nicola would pass away at the very young age of 42 in January of 1688. He and Jacqueline had been married only six years by this point. Jacqueline would pass away herself eight months later at the equally young age of 48. Now think about it. She had at least three children who were minors at this point. I do not know what happened to the younger children. I would assume her three oldest um, Children would have taken them in, and they would have raised their younger their younger siblings. That is what I would think would have happened. There would have there would be some paperwork that you would need to probably could find some custodial or guardianship. That would be you know something that definitely would be a good research. But even with such a you know early death, Jacqueline would leave us with 121 descendants. Just amazing in such a short time that she was able to leave such an incredible mark. What a story. Can you believe three marriages having to endure all that she went through? I can't imagine the perseverance, the determination, the ability to just keep on keeping on. It's truly an inspiration. Thank you so much, Jacqueline, for your contribution, your sacrifice, and ultimately the legacy you left behind in the 121 descendants that were alive as of 1729. So thank you to Jacqueline and her extraordinary life. I also want to say thank you to my patrons and supporters. You keep me fueled up and ready to go. And whenever I think, oh my gosh, I have 700 of these because that's my goal to finish all of the Fille Marie and the Fille du Roi. I have probably, if you look at it, probably about 700 of both series to do. So thank you to all of you, uh, subscribers, patrons, and supporters alike. You really are the wind beneath my wings. Thank you ever so much. And I will see you on episode 68 of Les Fille Marie.